Tell the story. Okay. This story I heard it when I was, I don't know, seven, eight, nine years old, seven, eight years old, nine years old. It, it, at that time, it had me very much fascinated. If you go back in history, where children were kidnapped, just disappeared. Uh, I'll give you a little example, and it's brought down, somebody that I knew wrote a book, and he brought it down, he met somebody, like in Russia, Jewish children used to just catch the, the child on the street and it just disappeared. A lot of these, they used to say, you recall, it used to be called the, the Legionnaires from France. This was a volunteer army. They volunteered there for life. The same thing with these kids that used to kidnap them. And this story was told to me. I never heard it. I never saw it anywhere, but it was told to me. And so then later somebody saw it, and it is written down somewhere, but I had never seen it. This man, pretty rich man, he was more like the representative of the community. All of a sudden, his son disappeared five, six years old, the child disappeared. They looked everywhere, and even through the law and so forth. The child was never found. They couldn't find it. Later, later on in life, <coughs> they made a decree, something the Jews uh, have to pay a ransom and they have to move out of the towns, and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So they didn't. In those days, most of your, uh, how should I say, politics was ruled by the church. I'm going back five, six, seven centuries. Seventh, uh, this is brought down, this is in the books. I, I think they called it feudalism. Mm -hmm. Did you ever hear of that? Yeah. Yeah. What you know what feudalism is? Why don't you tell me? Huh? Do you want to remind me? You don't recall. Something about the Middle Ages, right? Okay. Yeah. The church the church ruled practically all your politics. Okay. They ruled who is gonna who is gonna gonna have a job and who is gonna work and who is gonna do the different things and so forth. Because you in those days jobs were not available. We did, you didn't have factories and all modernization like you have. And that was a feudalism mainly means the church ruled everything. Anyway, they decreed something upon the Jews. So they, all of a sudden, they didn't, this man went to the church, the, the elders of, of the church, they couldn't do anything. So they decided they're going to send a representative to Rome to see the Pope. And this man, that his son disappeared, he was chosen to represent the speak, be the spokesman for the Jews. And he went. And finally, it took a while till he got an appointment, and they gave him an appointment. He said he could see the man come in such a such a time, they let you in and this. So he waited for the day and it went and the thing to sit down to talk and the first thing he asked him, does he play chess? So the man said, yes, I play chess, I used to play a lot. I don't play so often. The child that was kidnapped from him used to play chess with his father. Oh, his father taught him, taught him the certain moves and so forth. And he sat down at the table and he started playing. Played one day, and arranged to come back the next day, played with him the next day. And then, as they were playing the chess, the, the Pope, made a certain move on the chessboard. And 
the Jewish man was, I would just use the word, stunned. This only he knew and his son that disappeared knew. So he said to them, he looked at him and he said, how do you know this? He said, I don't know, somebody taught me this. And actually, as it turned out, he started talking, he couldn't say it was his son. It was, what, 30, 40 years already? And it made me curious, as I was as a child. I didn't have the, the encyclopedias at home like you have. One time I went to look in the encyclopedia. If you go back in history, there was always two popes. Not always, but quite a few years was two popes. One pope was in Rome, and one pope was in France. France is, at one time was a very, a country that was ruled mostly by the Catholics. Uh, you made that remark when I said something to you people always Spain, Spain was in position. Mm -hmm. And I made that remark to you girl, mm -hmm. the other, last week was it, about Francis, Personally, I think France was worse than than than. than good. If you look up in the encyclopedias, one pope is missing. Which pope? The seventh or eighth century. I don't remember exactly. And that's the one from the story. And some and the, my, the teacher told me that's the pope because later they found out he was Jewish and sort of. Mm -hmm. He eliminated quietly and he left and nobody knows oh. where, what, or when. That's a good one. It's a great story. That's amazing. <coughs> okay, so. And I went and looked it up in encyclopedias. And one is missing. For 30 years, no book. How old were you when you looked it up? How old? I don't right. remember how old I was. But like you were young? No, not at home. I looked it up and I was here in the States. Oh, so you remembered the story? I remember all the this story when oh I was a gosh. kid. That, that <laughs> my teacher told me that story. That's a great one. That's amazing. Okay. So, all right. last time we kind of went off and we were talking about your childhood. And so now we're going to do more of a wartime oh, interview. So, my first question is what were kind of the first signs of a Nazi presence in your town? I mean, when did you know that it really uh, wasn't a good situation? To begin with, we didn't see any Nazis in that town. The only thing you saw was the Hungarian gendarmes. Mm -hmm. You know, in Europe, the same thing, for instance, I don't know if you ever, ever read it, you once in a while you read about it. The police in Israel uh, arrested this one, uh, the police did this, the police investigated this um, person. I'm talking politics and politicians and so forth. The police there is not like here because in Europe, the police is part of the government. Mm -hmm. See, they're ruled and governed by the government. It's a, a minister, like you say, a certain section that uh, that's all they do. They, 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 certain people are picked, uh, I don't know, when they go in the army to, believe, to be in the police department and so forth, but uh, it's not like uh, each town here or each state has its own state police or city police and so forth. The police is mainly a national for the whole country. So, what we had was two police to call them the gendarmes. Mm. And we had the town had, I don't know, maybe three, four were stationed in our town. That's about it. We never had any, I should have said, riots or pogroms from the gentile people. We never had any, any problem of that in our town. Mm. Um, I know last time you mentioned that um, you did start to fear um, <clears throat> studying, you started to fear leaving. You feared a lot of times to travel. To 
to travel. What what made you fear that? I mean, when did you kind of know that it wouldn't be safe to travel? Uh, especially on the trains. Mm. Uh, you people uh, don't read that kind of stuff. You know, in Europe, used to say the. Matter of fact, I came across it not too long ago. They were called. There was a certain group of people in Hungary that joined Hitler. The armed guard, whatever they were called. And even the government that ruled was was part had part of them. Those people. Those people used to, uh, how should I say? Unleash and let some people go out and just cause trouble. I'll give you a little example. You heard of Christmas night, okay? You know what that, what, how that started? Uh, yeah, but why don't you tell me about it? Christmas night started. A Jewish boy went and killed a German in France. That was a delegate from the German embassy. I don't know what the story was exactly there, but he shot him and killed him. And that Gables figured this is a good excuse to unleash a big pogrom on the Jews in Germany. That's how the crystal not started. So they figured what did they gonna how they gonna burn all the synagogues. They're going to break in homes and rob the homes and tear this up. This, how, this, this is how it started. At the first night, I don't know, maybe 30 people, when the first night when they started burning, they killed people. And that's how they started the, the, these programs. People don't realize uh, this dates back many, many of years where they used to have these programs in the Ukraine and in Russia and uh, not so much like we come from Austria-Hungary Empire you didn't have, mostly you had it from the Tsars mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, we never had it we never, I can really say we never had it they had it in Romania, I think I mentioned to you last time mm -hmm. in Yash where they round up a lot of people and the on guard or the on shirt, whatever they, they called themselves. I remember as a kid they had uh, a certain name, certain names of people, certain groups. And what they used to just, for fun, go out and have uh, to rob Jews, beat them up and so forth. And people were afraid of the trains. But they used to throw them off of the trains during mm -hmm. different areas. Like uh, the train goes through a certain bridges or a certain mountain, you just throw people up. You just pick them up, throw them out of the windows. And these would be the trains going. And that's why the people stopped uh, stopped uh, traveling too much. Yeah. Um, when you heard about this, was it kind of word of mouth, or did you hear it on the radio? Uh, the, newspaper? the Jews were not allowed to have radios, <laughs> so the the preacher. He used to relay different things and tell me what he heard to some people in his closer by that he heard this on the radio or he heard that on the radio. Uh, you might find this very, very funny or awkward. We didn't have any electricity in that time. Mm. The town, we, or you had what they call kerosene lamps. It was very rural. Or a candle. Right. So Otherwise we didn't have electricity. Yeah. Uh, if we traveled maybe uh, 20 miles, 20 kilometers, 25 kilometers, then you had, we had, you had electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, don't, don't look at it so much. Take this country. The rural area, the farmers and the country and the, didn't have lights here either. It was passed a law and Roosevelt came in and every place 
has a right to be connected to light, to electricity. And uh, I don't know what it was, how much they had to pay or how much the town had to pay, but you have to furnish electricity to that person. You have to furnish that person sewage. You have to finish that person water and so forth. Uh, Till Second World War, you didn't have it in the United States anyway. And I don't think they taught you that in school. Of course we did. Oh, you you lived in Baltimore. Oh. <laughs> but you go out in these smaller towns. Oh, oh, Today, I what, see. you didn't have electricity. I see. You didn't have, to go out of, the, out of the main city, you didn't have no sewage. You didn't have no water. You had to have, pump it up with your hand. <laughs> you didn't turn the speaker on and the water was flowing. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was wondering about um, when there were, if, if there were any restrictions in your what? Um, Jew, on yes, it was always a restriction. The Jews couldn't do this or the Jews uh, go in business or a Jew do different things. Uh, they always try to, how should I say, curb them, the Jew this and the Jew that and so forth. And that was only, uh, that was only, not when I was a young, young kid, that was only 1940, 1939, mm. that that came in. Before that, as a matter of fact, I don't think you people know this even, the Jews of Transylvania, when, when, when Hitler occupied Romania, he only occupied it for one thing, for one reason. There was a city, what is called Pleasure. And nearby that town, there was a lot of oil. They pumped a lot of oil out of the ground. That's why he, he wanted the petrol. Uh, then, I don't know what the deal was between the governments, when he occupied Romania, Transylvania was given back to Hungary. Mm. The Romanian Jews were never shipped out to Auschwitz. A lot of them got killed in pogroms, a lot of them Herat, some of them were sent away to the ghetto to Transnistria, but they were not sent out to Auschwitz. Mm. Um, as a question, did you have to wear um, a yellow, yellow star? star? Yes. If I went out in the town or go with, with the streets of the town, uh, I had to wear mm. a certain jacket, I put that star on. If I wanted to go a certain place, I put that on. At that point, was there some sort of um, presence, like a Nazi presence? No. Still no, no presence? No. What year did you have to start wearing the star? 43, 44, something like that. Wow. Um, did you continue school at that point? Any education? No. I didn't go to school. That was just... Uh, I don't think I went to school anymore. Regular school. Um, did you have any relocation? Like, was your family relocated to any certain areas? In uh, 1944, uh, and if I'm not mistaken, it was right the day after Pesach. Mm -hmm. And I got a, I think, Pesach ended on the Sabbath evening. And Sunday morning they took us to the ghetto. Sunday during the day they took us to the ghetto to a different town. See what they did? They took around seven, eight, or ten small towns, and they were located them all in one place. Mm -hmm. um, do you know what ghetto this was? Mm -hmm. It was uh, the name Dragomarest. Um, how far away was this? To your village. From my town, I would say 30 miles, maybe, yeah. 30, maybe, maybe a little more, or 30, 30, I would say around 30 miles. Yeah. What town was it? Do you know? Uh, was it Naples? Naples. was in early April, I don't remember the exact date. Mm. Uh, I put 
look, next time you come, I'll look it up for you. Okay. Um, I can look back all these years. Yeah. What were, um, I mean, as a child, what were your reactions to being relocated? Nobody liked to leave home. Right. Nobody liked to leave home and go away. You know where you're going to live, and you might live in that some kind of barn or something. You leave your home. But you didn't have any choice. You were forced to leave. Yeah. And we didn't, how should I say, we didn't, nobody could uh, imagine or realize uh, what would become of it. And nobody liked to stay back because you were a you never know what the consequences is going to be from this. Mm -hmm. uh, that's about it. Nobody wanted to separate from the family. Everybody was trying to stick together. Right. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any specific incidents like your parents' reactions, other adult reactions? I have a, you know, I was a kid. Right. I couldn't understand some, but I remember a man making a remark one morning in the synagogue. To you people, it's going to sound awkward. Before we took us all away to the ghetto, this man, he never survived the poor soul died in Auschwitz. But he had a daughter survived. As a matter of fact, she passed away in New York. The last name, I even remember the last name was Stabber. And he said, who knows where we're going to wind up if we are even going to have a burial. Mm -hmm. I and mean, to you it doesn't sound that much today, but when he made that remark, it made me, it made me a little thing. What are you going to do with him? You're not going to bury him. I never heard of cremation and all that kind of stuff as a kid. Mm -hmm. uh, we never heard it, we never saw it at home. Yeah. Um, I mean, what were Go your, ahead. well, I mean, in essence, what were your reactions when you just heard burial? Did you know that? No, I didn't. That you I couldn't, know. it was something new. What did he mean by that? Yeah. I was only a kid. Right. What does he mean when, who knows if I'm even going to have a burial? Um, when you did get to the ghetto, how long were you there? Oh, four, five weeks, six weeks, somewhere. But if, I would say around five weeks. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of life in the ghetto, um, I mean, first off, what did the ghetto look like? Was there a wall? Did you have a lot no. of freedom? No, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I really don't know if. Uh, if the ghetto was watched, if he were going out, I don't know. The only thing I know is to try and get the young, the younger generation, the younger kids to go and fix the roads and do this. And used to catch you and grab you say, you have to come to work today and do this and do this and do this. And many times, I'm not ashamed to say it, I hit out mm. somewhere where they couldn't find me. And uh, I'll tell you something else. I, I learned something in, even in the ghetto. Mm -hmm. We were kids a couple of my age. That's when I learned to play chess. We hit an attic. Mm -hmm. We were a couple of kids, so you got to do either you play cards or you play chess or you do something. So that's what I learned to play chess. <laughs> um, when you talk about they, like they would take you and go to work, who, who did you mean by they? They, yeah. I would refer to the police and so forth. Mm -hmm. There, I saw Germans already in the ghetto. Okay. The Nazis. The Nazis. Yeah, I saw Germans. Mostly, you saw with us, mm. because there were certain groups of Germans, and the people don't realize it's called the, the SS, and it was the Wehrmacht, the regular German army. There wasn't the Wehrmacht. It was SS. Mm. The crosses, you know. So. Yeah. Um. What was the living situation like in the ghetto? In the ghetto, you whatever you brought yourself from home, that's what you ate. Mm -hmm. They didn't issue any 
kind of foods or anything that I can remember. Whatever you brought from home, you ate it, which you had to eat. And what was your house situation like? Did you share an apartment with other people? Uh, you know? I'm trying to think where, where we slept. It wasn't, it might have been on an extension from a house or something there, but it wasn't uh, the luxury of bedrooms and so forth. Right. No. Um, in terms of also, did you, what was your job? You said you mentioned you had a job in the That were these to catch me uh, to, uh, they're there, the streets are not like here. Most of your streets there is uh, dirt roads. No, it's pressed stone with a roller with sand. Mm. They used to, I remember they used to catch me and ask me to go work there as a machine. They used to have, and you just feed the stones, and the machine used to crush them, and you had to haul them away and pile them up in different areas and so forth. And uh, that's what we had to do. Yeah. And then some people went out on the highway and tried to fix different things. Would they would they give you compensation for that? No food or anything? Mm -hmm. Nothing. And if you didn't take something to eat or drink, you didn't eat and you didn't drink. In terms of sanitation, um, were there a lot of sanitation problems in terms no. of sharing toilets? No. Or no. No. Well, the time was too short to have any problems in the ghetto for with, with sanitation. Yeah. Um, what were any uh, consequences if you didn't work? No. No. You just kind of got yelled at? That's mm. mostly, it was very few that volunteered for the job. But they used to say, so many got to have from this area or this group. Mm -hmm. So many have to come and go to work. So usually, most of the time, uh, in the beginning especially, just ignored it. Then later they said, you have to go, you have to go, and so forth. Okay. Somebody has to show up for your family. And if, say, they caught you not showing up for work after they told you to work, were there any consequences no. for that? No. Um, also, in terms of um, uh, reactions with other families, people you lived with, um, were there any tensions with people, with their... You always have have some especially when you have a lot of kids involved and this involved. But we didn't, that, not that I recall to have any, I don't remember if we knew too many people in the, whatever they put us up or set us up to stay in the ghetto. Were there any, um, just I guess in essence? The only thing they did in the ghetto, the day before I think it was, and you brought up a very interesting subject. The day before they shipped us out from the ghetto, they separated, they took the, the how should I say, the men, with the exception of the small children. They took the, even the grown-up boys and the men, and they separated them from their wives and children. Mm. They, I remember they took them into a school building, and then they, put them out there, they stayed there overnight. And the next day, they had to go to a certain place and there the, the wives and the children were there waiting for them. Mm -hmm. um, I guess also in just in terms of living with other people, were there any other kind of interactions, like sharing of food, sharing of living space? I don't like recall that? sharing that kind of stuff. Each one stayed by itself. Yeah, that's very kind of stable. No, not too much mixing one with another. Right. Um, were there any kind of cultural activities or religious activities going on? Maybe concerts or even just religious services? Not, not in the ghetto. Not to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. Was there a synagogue? They might have said have some people gather and dove them or pray together or. Uh, on the Sabbath to read the Torah together, but otherwise, mm -hmm. to my knowledge, I don't, I don't recall of anything like that. Okay. Um, when you were in the ghetto, did you hear any news about what was going on Not outside? Much. Not much. Not much. Mm -hmm. Not much.
because uh, it's a funny thing. I mean, after the war, I mean, I've been with Polish people and other people from big cities and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, you people might find it. Uh, you know, people say maybe 2,000 Jews survived in Berlin during the war. Did you start to think what that means? 2,000 Jewish people survived in Berlin all during the war. Do you know what that means? That means somebody had to feed them, somebody had to give them clothes, somebody had to give them shelter. And in Germany, anybody who was caught up in the Germans, hiding a Jew, I might have shot him. And it was a very famous book that I took it out from the Hebrew University here in Baltimore, in Park Heights, many, many years ago, I remember reading it. And it's about approximately 2,000 Jews. And there was no ghetto, no concentration camp, and they survived in Berlin, hiding out different areas in different parts and so forth. And the, the, the Gestapo could never catch them. Mm -hmm. And they did, if they did catch one, and they knew, but there wasn't what they could do. They knew what German would leave food outside today, and what German would leave the money to buy something tomorrow. And they used to go from place to place. They never slept in the same place two nights, mm -hmm. <clears throat> because they were afraid. They were afraid. If a, Jew, a Gestapo man caught one of those Jews, young guys, they wouldn't send them away to, or kill them or so forth. They said, we'll, get, we'll let you go in one condition. You turn us in other ones. They used to call them the catchers. Mm -hmm. They used to tell, go there and there, the Gestapo, and you'll find somebody to be able to catch them. So they were called the catchers. It was very interesting, this book of what I read. And one of them wrote it uh, after the war. Right. And, but we, we never had anything like that. Um, um, when you were in the ghetto, did you yeah. hear about things like the different camps going on, labor no. camps? Nothing. But to begin with, once you were I should say, trapped in that circle. You had no way of communicating with anybody, anything. You know, if you go back to history when Auschwitz was established, two people escaped. Nobody believed them. They were so, they, they came all the way from Poland. One came to England, the one was shipped here. Nobody believed them. Something like this to happen to kill. At that time, there was no crematoriums yet in in in, in Auschwitz, mm. where they burned all the, the corpses, all the bodies. And there was in those days that they used to bury them. And then they had a big flood, and all these corpses came out. They realized the burial will not do. So that's when the crematoriums were built. Mm. Did you ever see people just sort of disappear from the ghetto? Um, perhaps we said. Run away, you mean? Yeah. Some people, a few people, not too many. Singular. Mm. Disappeared. They ran away. They ran away. They ran away and they hit out. But uh, all by himself, it's not an easy, easy thing to, to exist. And I guess uh, the Gentile would be afraid they might be finish, uh, face punishment and so forth and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was not an easy thing besides. Who would uh, leave the family? I, I, I'll never see them again. Uh, not many not many people would break break away and uh, go by, I'm not gonna, that's it, I'm leaving. Mm -hmm. You know, not many people do that. Did you witness any people um, be sent to camps? They didn't show any cruelty in the ghettos or anything. The only thing when they're on the sub, like you asked before, 
I told you they separated the men from the from the women and children. And the next day they got them together. That particular area, you had to walk uh, maybe 10, 15, 20 kilometers to the train. Mm -hmm. The only transportation there we had back and forth uh, two, three, four times a day to the big cities was buses. There was no train. All the transports were moved by train. Mm -hmm. So what they did, they took the whole ghetto and made the people walk. How would you say a short, a short distance to the train, and there was all the the wagons, the train waiting to be loaded and so forth. Mm. Um, I, but as like a last, in terms of seeing people, did you see anyone get sent to a camp by any chance? Not from the ghetto. Not from the ghetto. Not from the ghetto. Okay. In Auschwitz, when they selected people to go to war. Everybody was separated, and you were put in this category, this and that. Then I realized uh, who I saw, and, but uh, not many survived. Mm -hmm. The harsh labor, and it was not so much the food. You know, you'd be surprised how much the body can take, how much punishment the body can take. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, today you say you, you can live on a 1,200-calorie diet. Mm. And I believe it. But the treatment was... I'll give you a little example. I worked in a camp. I had to go 15 kilometers, wake up 4.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. and sometimes we got some coffee. Sometimes she did black coffee. Then you had to stand in your group of people and you start walking. You walk the 50 miles to the wood, mm -hmm. in the tunnels. You stayed in the tunnel, you couldn't even drink a drink of water. There was no way to get. I was a very lucky man. Mm -hmm. I was very young in those days. And you heard the word Volksdeutsche. I mean, the, the, the German, a civilian German. Mm -hmm. They used to drive those locomotives into the tunnels, haul out the rock that we blasted out, and bring it out and dump it. To drive a locomotive, like a train. Mm -hmm. But it was in a smaller set, set up. Mm -hmm. It was much, much smaller. So, once in a while, it needs to go over. Can I have some water? Mm -hmm. As the, the guy, the engineer that drove this locomotive when I got a little work. And I was very, I knew I was lucky. I returned the sticker on and underneath I had a can. He gave me some hot work. Some hard work. Mm -hmm. And in the winter it was very good hot work. In the summer I let it cool off and of that. Because there was no other way of getting any liquid in or anything. Um, which camp was this? It was all, all the, no, not the first one. And the first one, see, how should I explain you? After you were picked from, to go to war, to go to a labor camp, uh, we came in 12 o'clock at night, let's say. We, the, all, everybody came in at night. All the trains came in at night because the people from right now, Days because everybody, no transport, four or five days constantly on the train ride. Mm -hmm. So when you do arrive there, if you go, arrive to Ashwood, let's say, in the afternoon, you stayed in that train till it got to your door, and then the train back to the building out, and everybody got disembarked. Everybody got out. I told you right away, leave everything there, just get out. Mm -hmm. And then when you get out, they tried to scare the person so that, how should I say to you in English, the person was disoriented. Mm -hmm. And each, each of us had a big dog with him, the dog barked and so forth. 
And the first thing they did, they separated men, separated women. Some of the women were picked to go to work, some of the men were picked to go to work. Could you just, um, let's backtrack a little and explain the um, process of going from the ghetto to the to Auschwitz. Auschwitz, how you were picked to go to a certain camp? When, once you were put on the train, everybody went into the ghetto. From the ghetto, everybody went in on the train for five, I would say four to five days to travel. Don't forget, we, we were in, in Transylvania, the, and we had to travel all through Transylvania, all through Hungary, to get to Poland, because Auschwitz was originally at the border of Poland and Germany. In the town, it was a famous town there for many, many years. It was very famous as a Jewish town. It was called Ashwatin. Today, not too long ago, a year or two ago, the elders there must have buried all the utensils from the synagogue, from the, the crowns, from the Torah, and so forth. They all found them all. And there is a Jewish town today, there is a few Jews went back there they built the synagogue and so forth. To travel from where I lived all the way there, like I said, the train never backed in into the camp, only at night. And after we backed in, everybody got disembarked. Women on one side, men on the other side. There was a famous man, Mangala, I don't know if you ever heard that name. Mangala, he did. He was the doctor of Auschwitz. Mm. He used to, he had four, four in a row, four people. He used to go by and take a look. He had a cane sometimes. He used to grab you with the cane, you come out. That means he picked you out to, to be sent to labor camp. Go like this, go this one, go this one, go this one. It was also a question, how many people did they need in the labor camp. Because some transport depict more, some of the transport depict less. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you a very interesting coincidence. And he and all of a sudden came by me, he took the cane and pulled me out. Over there. Over there. Go ahead, give it to him. <laughs> So he picked me up. Later, I take a look. When we were already marching away from there, I see my father. So later he needs to come back and pick my father up. And he picked some other guys up. And some other guys out that I know from home. But it's a very interesting thing that happened. And I couldn't never figure it out till about two, three months ago. All these years I couldn't figure something out. And uh, I usually figure my, my problems out and I could not figure that out. After we picked us out, and you were stripped. The same men and women, everybody was stripped. Curled your hair off, everything. And then after the shower June, the bed, they, you, they gave you the certain clothes that you wore in the camp, and they marched you to a certain barrack. The barrack was locked on the outside. In the morning we got out, I see big wire fences, 20 feet high. I take a look, uh, for, I see a lot of women and children. So I go closer and take a look. I said, maybe I'll recognize somebody there. I don't recognize anybody. No recognize, I walk away. They were there all day, the children playing. When the evening came, they gave us some food, which we could nobody could eat in the beginning. The, the, the food they served you there. So 
So they locked us back up in there during the night and everybody came to sleep. The first, was it the first night or the second night, somebody opens the door, wide open, calls a name. He keeps on calling that name. Finally, somebody answers that name. Who the name was for what, I don't know. You heard the name, there was people called Capos? No. A Capo was, the only difference between him and the, the German, he didn't have no, no guns. He was, fit, he was the same thing, incarcerated like me in the camp, but he was, he was like, an overseer over me. And these two guys come in there and they call a certain name. They were dressed in black. So finally some guy comes out and they start questioning. And they be bad. Very, very bad. So somebody said, why would he they were looking for somebody that sent those guys out from the ghettos. And I'm talking ghetto. Take, for instance, Lodge Ghetto in Poland, where they had half a million people. We were what? My town had 400 to 500 people. That town had, we were maybe three, 4,000 people in our train, our transport. In those days, from Poland, they used to have the a representative from the, and they are the ones who said, you go today, and you go, and you go, and so forth. Some, some of these people, maybe they favored other people, maybe they didn't. So in the meantime, these two guys must have got shipped from a certain ghetto before. And they wanted to take revenge on somebody that had something to say in the ghetto when they shipped him. So when they came, they must have been notified by somebody. So they went looking for him to get revenge. So anyway, what I'm trying, let's go back to what I was telling you before. Mm -hmm. There were these women and children. So the second night, we went in. And then the next morning, we come out not sold in there. No women, no children. Nobody. In 1945, how should I start this in the middle and explain stuff? When I was liberated in 1945 in Baden-Belsen, I only stayed, I was liberated April the 15th by the British. And I stayed around in that area till maybe the middle of June. I found some relatives. The closest I found was my father and his father were brothers. We grew up together. He might have been two years older than I was, but we grew up together. And he was very, very sick and bad. So I said to him, I'm going out, maybe I can find something for you. So he said, see if you can bring me cigarettes. For cigarettes you could buy anything. Mm -hmm. It was more worth than money. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I came back, I brought him cigarettes, I don't know how many packs. And he got himself something to eat. The second time I went away for a day, and I came back, he's not there anymore. So for them, it's the first thing in my mind, I thought he passed away. And the, the Red Cross used to come and pick up the, the dead people. Who was it, your cousin? The rape. Oh, no. So uh, he isn't there. So I went around asking the people around him, others, what happened? He said, we don't know. He didn't die. The only thing we saw men, people in white, with Red Crosses on him. Sick. Came and took him on a stretcher and took him out. He couldn't walk, he was that weak. Took him out. 
So I thought to myself, I have to be the Red Cross. So I started asking questions, where is the Red Cross located in Bergen? So I kept on asking, they told me go there and there and there. One place, another place, another place, to finally I found the place. I said, you had that person here by the name so and so for this name. Yes. I said, where is he? Oh, he, he was on the boat already. He's in Sweden. We put him on the boat last night. After the war, the Swedish government allowed 15 or 18,000 sick people mm -hmm. to take him out of the camps and put him in the hospitals. Mm -hmm. Because most of these people were full of TB and full of typhoid. And I would say 80, 85 percent of them died. I was lucky, I was never sick. I was, what, 17, 18 years old? So I said to them, can I go to, if you want to know my name? The first thing they said, what are you, his brother? I said, yeah. Hmm. I was his first cousin. He put me on, he said, you come back here in such and such time tomorrow, and you can go. So I came back, I thought to myself, I have nobody in the family left. What am I gonna go home for? Whatever is there, I'm gonna find, when I get done, uh, when I get better and healthy and so forth, I can go home then. So I went, came back the next day, they put me on the train, I went away to, and I said in the name, it was called Lubeck. It's right near the, the ocean. You cross uh, what they call the Straits, and that puts you on the other side from Germany, and land in Malmo in Sweden. And I was there overnight. So, first thing they do there, you go through the same process again. They strip you and give you new clothes, they watch you. And the only difference there when we came to Sweden, they put all of us in quarantine. Quarantine is 21 days. In case you have some kind of disease, it will show and it will break out on you. And stay 21 days, you wouldn't even believe what happened. In the quarantine, some Germans, some assess, disguised themselves and also came with us. How do you know? So in the morning, they put us up before you went to wash up. What they have in there in that place, I don't know if you ever saw these farms, round ones, with spigots, and people go there and the water constantly around. So when we came to wash, he just washed his hands and wiped his face. So the guy said to him, why don't you take your shirt off and wash yourself like a man? He grabbed the shirt, and there was that tattoo, as has. People started got excited, started howling, beating, this, fighting with them. The next thing, the Swedish police came and took them away. Sweden didn't have anything against that man. They let him go. So there was one incident that happened to Sweden. We stayed there 21 days. I think I mentioned to you last time. That's when I found out but we found six, six or seven hundred girls. Now, some, some of my, two of my cousins were also in that group, were bought out by Himmler. I think I mentioned to you that last time. And that's where I found them. They came to see about who was in this transport. They thought maybe in the so that, yeah. But that was only one incident. So in Sweden, it was different. The country, they were free there, the SS. They didn't do anything to Sweden. The Swedish, uh, didn't even, I don't think they even punched. Mm. So that's how I got to Sweden. Mm. And from Sweden, you couldn't come to the United States after the war. I came as a student visa. And after I came as a student visa, after six months or a year, they took my passport away, and I was left here without a country. So 
is passed a law that everybody will feel a certain amount of people can apply to, for permanent visas. So I applied, and, uh, that's how I came, became a citizen. Wow. Um, well, we definitely want to get more into that in the next interview. Go ahead. But um, <laughs> uh, to kind of go back to Auschwitz really quickly, okay. um, First off, did you have any interaction with the doctor? So we never, we never, no. We, we never, like I said, I never could find out what happened to the women and children. Right. Let's go back to where we were left off. Okay. Two, three months ago, I go a lot in the synagogue here, right across the street. Walked up, somebody told me who he was. Since I walked up, I said, hello, you know, I was together with your father and your grandfather in the camp. Mm -hmm. All through the camp, many, many months, we worked in the same details, the same tunnels and so forth. I don't know, at the beginning, maybe it didn't enter his mind. Then he called me up from L.A. He was a brother-in-law to the rabbi of the shul of the synagogue. He calls me for night from LA. He lives in the Sanctuary. Would I give him an interview? I said, what do you mean give me an interview? I said, your father won't tell you about the, the camps. He said he won't tell us anything. I said I was there with him. But that's your grandfather. His grandfather also passed away before the before deliberation, just like mine. So I can I come at such and such a time? I said, yeah, I'll give you a few hours. Excuse me, can I say something? He would never speak of that anything. In the beginning, For I years. didn't talk anything here. For you, I My kids yeah, either. He no. would never speak so, of his children or me. So after he, he came back, so he brought his brother. There are two brothers. So he brought his brother here. Mm -hmm. And we then back in the rabbi's study, we start talking after. I said to him, we start, after we start talking, I said, when did your father, you know what your side means? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The yearly yeah. memorial for your parents. I said, when does he keep the, the, the yearly memorial? So he tells me. You know any Hebrew? Very little. Very little. Twenty sixth of year. That's the second one. Nissan. The second one's after Peso. The twenty sixth of that month. I said I keep the same day. And I know. I even can tell you the day it was. It was the. It was a Thursday night we came in, and Friday was the twenty sixth because it was after Sunday was middle in the, the middle of the night. He looks at me and said, "How could that?" Matter? I said, you know something? You just gave me an answer that I couldn't answer for all oh, for since I was an Auschwitz. He said, what was it? I said, when we got up and I told the story, I saw these women and children. Now, I'll tell you what happened. You couldn't figure it out either. They brought in two transports, two or smaller transports. Mm -hmm. Usually it was one transport a night. They brought in two. They couldn't kill everybody that night, gas them, and cremate them. So they took the women and children from one transport and put them, set them up in there till the next day. I said, you know, you can tell your father. His memorial might be the 27th, a day later. I told him that, he said, you are right, makes sense, because it was a lot of women and children. So that's what happened. Mm -hmm. They could yeah. not kill two transports. See, every night, and they finished picking out these people for war, people put in gas chambers, and then cremation. Mm -hmm. All right, next. From there, we stayed in Birkenau a week. I think it was more than maybe. You were taking to Birkenau first? Yeah, that was part of Auschwitz. 
Bit, right. it, we call it Birkenau because that's what all the gas chambers and crematoriums were. Yeah. The, 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 the camp, Auschwitz didn't have that. Yeah. When you were, they had some, some uh, that corpse, they used to bring him to Birkenau to get cremated. How close was Birkenau to Auschwitz? It was that's a little more walking distance. Yeah, I've been there. It's the more walking distance. But one's closer to the city. That's you know what the big gates when the trains come in. Yeah. That's Birkenau. That's yeah. part of Birkenau. And that the train just ends that's there. That's right. That's part of Birkenau. So, so the march of the dead is from Auschwitz to the Birkenau. Um, in terms of Auschwitz, do you mind describing just the food? What the, the food. food? Like? In Auschwitz, I don't remember exactly. But the whole food consisted, they gave you a soup every day. It was every day. And mostly the time, they used a lot of barley or potato soup. And they gave you, most of the time they gave you, I don't know, a pound of, half a pound of bread. And they gave you, uh, maybe a, an ounce, maybe two ounces of margarine. And they gave you a piece of uh, kielbasa, but they call it uh, like bologna or something. And, uh, and somebody used to say, how can you eat that? That's horse meat. When you try to survive, you eat anything you can put in that gut. Mm. But believe me, a lot of people wouldn't eat it. Very, the elderly, the middle-aged people, very, very few survive. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said to you before, you get up in the morning, you get a little black coffee to drink, and, and you start walking 50 kilometers, and you work all day long. And anywhere from 10, 12 to 40, uh, you didn't work more than 10, 12 hours, but you had to stay, stay in a pedal to be counted for an hour here and an hour there and stay on your feet constantly. Then if the, sometimes we used to get a ride with the train back to camp. And if it was bombardment, we didn't get a ride. We had to walk back. You walk 30, 25 or 30 kilometers every day and work all day and, and didn't get anything all day long till you went back to the camp. You got your rations, your soup, and Whatever you have, you received a piece of bread and so forth. The bread was half sawdust. You might not think I'm funny, but I mean, you could see the chopped up straw because they couldn't, at least we put it on straw to bake it in the oven. And uh, that's why so many people just died. We used to go every time back and forth in the back of the groove and we were walking we used to have this <coughs> cart on well, two wheels as a platform and people used to drag it. In case somebody dies, put him on there, bring him back to camp. You leave him dead in the road. So you brought him back to camp and then we took picked him up and came to the crematorium. <coughs> so that was that was a routine every day. It was the, 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 the treatments, it wasn't necessarily all the time the nourishment, the, the treatment, the body can only take so much and that's it. So another thing we started before about the quantity, and I, it took me uh, maybe three, four months before I found my cousin in Sweden. He was in a hospital and finally somebody came to our camp, I said, Maybe he came across this and this name. Oh yeah, he's there and there. So that's how I found him. One, two, three, faster than the, the Red Cross let me know. Mm. So uh, they gave me a ticket and I went to visit him. He recuperated. He just passed away. It was just a year. Mm. Um, after um, Birkenau, where did you go from there? I was shipped to Buchenwald. In Buchenwald, he photographed me, I had to fill out a paper, and he gave me a number. That's, after that, I was only known by the number, not by name. 
Was the number tattooed? No, I didn't have it tattooed. No. Anybody who came inside in the country, and especially the last couple of years, in the beginning they used to tattoo everybody came in touch with. Then they stopped and they just gave me, it should be a number here and here. Um, where was this camp? Like what town? Buchwald. Country. We went there five years ago, four years ago. Me and my grand grandson. Reinhardt, Reinhardt. Wait, is it in remember. Poland or Germany? Germany? Huh? It's in Germany? Yeah, in Germany. We went from here. From there. We went, what is it? Trying to think, did we go from here or from New York? We went to... I didn't go with no group, just me and him. Mm -hmm. He said, Zadie, you can talk German, you go ahead. He said, in the map and stuff. So I did. But I didn't do it German, I did in English. So um, we went. And, uh, first thing we went to Buchenwald. We, were, we went up to the city there, I can't remember, right about uh, five, eight miles from the camp. It's open for everybody. There. I didn't even recognize it. Because uh, everything was taken down. The only thing we did, we went to, there's an office, we went to the office, and I wanted to see if they have any records of me. Sure enough, they had my records, they had my father's records, mm -hmm. and so forth. My grandson, I didn't bother at them. It never occurred to me. I knew my father was born in uh, 1895. But I didn't know no other day, month. Or. So my grandson must have gone there and start looking at the computer. He found the paper that my father filled out. And see, because part of his name is after my father. Told him exactly when he was born. This, the same was this head. The same day. Crazy. January the 4th. Mm -hmm. he, um. he came back and says, Look, my friend, he showed me the paper. He's got a copy of it. And from there, they called up. I wanted to go to Dora, where I worked in the tunnels. But from there, I was shipped to Dora, to that camp. And they called ahead. And there was a woman in the office waiting for me. She gave me all the information. And uh, we took pictures. And she told, got somebody to take me to the tunnels. And, and my grandson came in in the tunnels. He couldn't believe his eyes. It was uh, amazing. Um, how long were you in the second camp for? The camp itself in the concentration camp, I would say about a year. In, Bu in Buchenwald for a year or all the camps? All the camps. Okay, so the entirety. Um, for the second camp, Buchenwald. But very few people. From all this transport that we would, I don't know, maybe 3,000, 4,000. Very few survived. Just the train rides. The train, the walking, and working in these camps. You work with an air drill all day long. You sometimes the, all the dust, you couldn't even open, focus your eyes. Mm -hmm. From the dust laying on top of your eyelids. Mm -hmm. And uh, no, like I said, no work. Did you just worry out? That was the main thing. It's not so much the food, the, 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 the punishment of the body constantly, constantly. And you know, believe it or not, for every man that survived, two or three women survived. Mm. Did your father um, go to either of these two camps? Uh, yes, yeah, he was with me all the time. Till January, end of January. 
they shipped me away to another camp nearby, and they shipped him away, and I know they shipped him away to Bedenville. It wouldn't surprise me he lays in one of his mass graves. It amazing. It's 60 mass graves in Bedenville. I don't care if anybody ever told me that. Uh, each grave contains between three and five thousand corpses. Um, well, uh, from Bushmal, where did you go from there? What was the camp after that one? From Bukhumal, I went to Dora. Dora. Where was that? About two hours drive by bus. They took a good one, but they did a truck. Also in Germany? All in Germany. All, all your camps yeah. were in Germany? Except for Auschwitz? Except for, that was near Poland, near the border. Auschwitz, it's called it. The town, that's where the camp was built. Um, and um, I guess just talking about maybe more of the work that you did, um, obviously we know the tunnels, but was there other work that you did? Yeah, they, sometimes they needed to go here and do landscaping, or sometimes they uh, to clean up the bombardment, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they, they used to, all night long they used to bombard a certain town or certain factories or it blocked the highways and this they used to take people from the camp to go and clean up and so forth. Um, do you have any specific, um, well first off, from Dora, where did you go after? From Dora, I think I went to the camp named Elrith. E-L-R-I-C-H and from there, and the last one before I went to ship to Bergen Belsen was Hartzungen. Also in Germany? Also. Nearby, they were all. All that area was full of labor camps. Mm -hmm. And most of them all worked in the tunnels. Would you march there or would they put you in trains? Walk. Well, when you would walk, did you see? Most of people walked. When you walked, did you see German civilians? Sure. And they, did they have any interaction? They never threw things at you? Never or? bothered to look at you. They just went by and they like, and after the word, they said, ah, we didn't know anything. We never saw these people. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, are there any specific experiences from one of these camps that you remember? Um, maybe like a religious experience or just a well, sense of friendship? Well, some relationships. people, you know, the holidays, it's amazing. This, this person knew this, this person knew this before. We knew every holiday when it came out. People knew how to, I don't know if I should explain you this, uh, how to count the Hebrew calendar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hebrew calendar, you only have what, 354 days. But you got to break down the 354 days, what they call it, to Kufos, the, the, the year. And you have to count so many days, we know about every holiday. People could remember that. And today was, like, we, I got off that whole year, one day from work, one day. And you'll never get, you would think there would be some religion to go on. The Gentiles? Christmas or New Year's? New Year's. New Year's. Not Christmas. I thought I heard Christmas. Christmas, we went to work yeah. the same. The same yeah. as any other day. Just New it's Year's. New Year's. Why not? Mm -hmm. it was the New Year we got off. Why do you think you got off New Year's? They didn't give anybody off. Folks, don't forget. If we didn't work, why do you think, if you, you, I don't know if you understand it, all these camps, most of the camps were liquidated before the Americans approached, before the Russians approached, before the British approached, all these camps, he tried to hold on to the slave labor. It's that simple. 
if he didn't have the slave labor, Germany couldn't carry on the war like that the way they did. It's the slave labor. But don't forget, he had 12, a small country like Germany. Don't compare Germany to the United States. The United States is 10 times the size of Germany. The United States has got what? 250 million people here. There you got what? 70, 80 million people. And he had an army, people on their arms, 12 or 14, 12, over 12 million people. So somebody had to do the labor. When you, when you, you, you arm so many people, uh, have fronts all over Europe. You know, people don't realize something. They give, I don't know if you people ever heard, there was a dictator in Yugoslavia, his name was Tito. You ever heard that name? The people, he, and during the war, was a partisan. He fought with the partisans in Yugoslavia during the Second World War. And they give the man credit for tying up five, a half a million German soldiers in Yugoslavia. They couldn't go out to the front because Tito was part of the partisans, so organized that Germany had to keep a half a million soldiers in Yugoslavia. Because of it. Did you ever have any contact with any of the partisans? No. They never tried to approach the camps, right. and the camps were not. But uh, it's something. Uh, Anything else? So after, after, uh, take for instance Auschwitz. Auschwitz was liquidated two weeks before the Russians entered it. Wherever they couldn't ship out by train, they made the people walk. And if you fell down, they shot you, they left you there. People, because they didn't want to give up on the, on the slave labor, they kept on pushing. I'll give you a little example. I worked in the, in the camp, Hartung. Bergen, Belgium might be three hours, four hours. If you ride by, 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 by truck, by train. I rode seven, eight or nine days by train. Because wherever we went, it was all bombarded. The train couldn't go through the stations. So back again, try there. But he wouldn't let the people alone in the camps. He always owned it. So they finally shipped us off to Bergen Belgium. And I went back with my grandson four or five years ago. The guy looked at us. I asked him, is this such and such a thing still available? Sure, you can see it. You want to see it? So he put me in a jeep and took me out and showed it to me. Where we embarked when we, they brought us to Bergen Belt was even a platform where the train was the end of it. And, and we all disembarked there and went out. I said, I remember before he even went, I said, it's still a big fence. He said, yeah, the fence is still there, but it's a lot of names on it. The people were shot, they couldn't walk, so they shot them there. People don't realize. And you know, I think I mentioned to you last time, most of these people that this SS, they were never brought to court or to justice. Mm -hmm. Most of them were volunteers. And I would say at least half were from all over Europe. Some were from Romania, some were from Hungary, some were from Yugoslavia. And these people, after the war, just picked themselves up and went back home. At home, they didn't know what they did in Germany. And even, even the Germans, some of them, eh, some didn't, didn't know. But I went to a camp, I told you I went to Sachsenhausen, that's near Berlin. And I went to Berlin, uh, 
It was mentioned the other day in the paper, somebody about, about Saxon. Anyway, the wall, and this side of the wall, the town, is the people, a street. Like, you tell me they didn't know what was in there, and that was a political. All the foreigners were brought to Saxon. All the people that were not Germans were brought to Saxon. There was a, a Gestapo camp. No, anything else? Um, did you have any experiences with like Nazi personnel specific to you in these camps? No. Yeah, I never. I tried to stay out of this. But those people, you never win. <laughs> you never win. I could. Uh, I was told this and another thing, people don't heal. They, they didn't, they were not so harsh. I noticed sometimes the elderly, they were much, much harsher on the elderly people than the, the young people. I cannot, you would think it would be the opposite. You know, after right after the war, for my town, a lot of young ladies and young girls went through the war, they, survived and so forth. Did you see my father? Did you see my father? I said, I saw your father. Your father is not on him. Best book. There was quite a few that I was together with, not all the young. After the war, your father is not around. He came, he was picked to go to labor too, but he never survived. Excuse me a minute. Couldn't it be that they didn't have the patience? For the older people? Nah. Mm. They just let it out of the elderly people. Mm. Yeah. I'm talking other people, I'm talking middle age. Mm. But they were much older. They were older than I was. Yeah. Did you have any special relationships in the camp? No. Friends or no. anything? You helping someone with them? tried to take care of my father as much as I could. And that was enough for me. That was enough for me. Because when you finished work, you didn't feel like doing anything. You just went back to camp, you ate your soup, and you were done for the day. Very seldom you saw people going around, and, uh, kibitzing with other people, and so <laughs> forth and so forth. Yeah. By the time you were done, you didn't feel like doing anything. Collapsed. And, uh, and go out in the winter was very cold. And it hardly gave you any clothes to, to, to put on. If I would tell you what I tried to keep warm, but you would never believe it. I remember when they told me, you know, if you get caught, you're going to be punished. I said, well, I'll worry then. In the meantime, I cannot go out. I'm cold. What did you use? What kinds of things did you use? Paper bags. Went out for the head, for the arm. Where did you get that? Um, Different ways in the camp. Sometimes a cement bag. Lots of other ways. You stay in the, like the first time they issued blankets for each, for five people got a big blanket to cover. That blanket didn't last half of the night it was all cut up. Mm -hmm. People could have their feet, people need the thing. But I never never folded blankets. There was no other way to to keep warm. Mm -hmm. You didn't have no heat or anything like that. The only heat you had, one body to do next to the other, that's the only thing. Mm -hmm. One kept the warm uh, one kept warm the other one, so Pack us in like, like the pack of sardines, 130, 100, 120, 130 people in one of these uh, wagons from the train. They sit down one after another, they pack them in. Like I said, the food was not always the, the, the main issue. Some camps had a little better food or more often. Sometimes if they didn't have the bread, they didn't issue it. But, uh, in some 
people just couldn't take it. They gave up on themselves. And once you gave up on yourself, your chances of survival were not too, too, too good. Mm -hmm. uh, if you make your mind up, you want to get out of here. I used to say when I was even my young in the camp, I said, I hope to get out of here, yes. And I was lucky, I never got sick. Mm -hmm. I think that played a very big role. That's where I learned to be so stubborn. Were you ever um, injured by doing the work? The only thing, one time I got injured, yeah. But I never went back there again. Uh, we were laying track for the train. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got these two fingers caught and the nails pulled off. They were just hanging in this half of this. And I remember after we got up from work, I went into an infirmary in there. I said, maybe you can help me. So I took a look, took a pair of scissors, put it underneath the nail, just cut it off, and took some, <laughs> look at it, and took some <laughs> Vaseline, put it on, goodbye. I never went back. Mm -hmm. And it healed okay? It healed okay. Painful. When it was cold, God was that pain. First time in my life, about a, about a month, a month and a half ago, I went to the shirab. But my toe. He had an ingrown toenail, and he was. I went to this. Oh. And he took a look. He this said, guy can take pain, but... He I said to me, you know, it's infected. I said, I know, that's why I came here. <laughs> I know it's infected. He said, looks at it. He said, uh, I'm going to... So, I thought he's going to go and numb it. He took out a satchel. He took the nail and put it inside. I thought he's going to numb it and... The, 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 the edge out of it and when it grows in into my tail. He caught it all right, but he never numbed the tail. Oh. He took a pair of surgical scissors, I know, you know what that is, and he got a hold of the nail and twisted it and tried to pull it out. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> in Baltimore? Yeah. Oh, God. We live in Baltimore. I know. So he pulled it out and I can a lot, take a lot of pain. I never have, if I have a tooth or something fixed or some a pool, I never take a needle or anything. Just go right at me. So, yeah. and when I eat that, that I said, I, when I holler, I didn't holler, I said, you gotta hold that chair. I said, it's all right now. I said, oh, it's over, he says to me, it's over. But anyway, he pulled it out, and he gave me four or five pills, four pills, I think it was. He said, I want you to take these, but don't take them till you see your doctor. So the next morning, I went to my doctor. I said, uh, I had some done to a toe, and he told me not to take the pills unless you gave me permission. He said, you can look at the pill. He said, you can take it. Uh, I'm supposed to call him that day later on. So I called him, I said, do you do this to all your patients? <laughs> he wouldn't answer. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, let me switch the tapes. Um.